每次看到这个片头，都会觉得特别的震撼。各位央视新闻的网友，大家早上好，周末愉快。君不见，黄河之水天上来，奔流到。Inspired, dear viewers, good morning. A Tang poem wrote that、uh, the water of the river comes from the heaven, yet it flows all the way to the east, to the ocean. And、uh, the Yellow River is the mother river of China. It has shaped the spirit of the Chinese nation and cultivated the Chinese civilization. So you are now watching a special program for 13 days, and this is the program titled "Follow the River." Follow the Yellow River into the sea. We'll be joined with all the viewers to the very starting point of the Yellow River, and we're going to travel across the nine provinces and cities. And maybe、uh, one of these cities and、uh, provinces are your hometown. So, from this map behind me, let's have a recap. <coughs> Yesterday, we used different perspectives. And gave you a picture to the Yellow River source, and this is roughly at an altitude of、uh, 4,000 meters. And yesterday at our program, we followed the river all the way to Aba in Sichuan Province, and this is the point that a lot of you may not recognize, but it's actually a perfect shape here. It's the it's here that the Yellow River. Uh, Crisscross the city and uh, mag uh, shows this magnificent spirit. In Sichuan, it's turned all the way to the northwest direction, and then it enters into Qinghai Province again. And yesterday at our program, you saw the very magnificent scene of this、uh, big curve of the Yellow River. And yesterday, we invited Nobel Literature Laureate. The famous writer Mo Yan, who told us his story with the Yellow River, and、uh, yesterday you also saw a wonderful performance by one of the artists、uh, that is related to the Yellow River. So a lot of the viewers are more than inspired by our program. So in today's program, we call our program today the impression of Yellow River. So what is your impression about the Yellow River? Let's play a couple of photos and let's show you what the impressions we are gonna tell you in today's program. Now the first photo. So it was taken at a hilltop. These two people they are wearing Tibetan clothing, and this comes from a film from the director Obama Tsai Dan and.、Uh, So this is his first impression with Yellow River. He never thought he could become a film director. So in today's program, he's going to join us and share with us his impression and his memory about the Yellow River. Now the second photo. This is just beautiful. You can see the sunset. You can see the curves and crisscrosses of the river. And so if you are lucky enough, you can. Board on a helicopter and have a bird view of the Yellow River. So the Yellow River on the vast land of China is just like the very wild form of Chinese calligraphy. So on this river here, at this section, you see not just the natural beauty but also the beauty of modern engineering projects. So this comes from Huang Shenghui. He is a very famous photographer, and his works have always been included. In National Geography, and he says that wherever the Yellow River flows to, I'm gonna follow the river and take photos. So he sees the Yellow River from a different angle, and he's gonna join us later in the program. Now the next photo. So, looking from a distance, it doesn't look very lush, but I can tell you that this is very rare. It was taken at Qinghai's Tibetan Autonomous Region in Guinan County. So, with the efforts of the locals, this Gobi Desert is transformed into this scene that you see right on the screen. And they are using some very secret technology 
to achieve that. And I don't know how many of you watching are also in this industry. And if you are, you can share with us your expression, your memory fighting the desert. So now let's take a look at this photo. So this is just a Tibetan uh, community that is surrounded by mountains. And this is taken in Machu County of the south of uh, Gansu province. And in 2017, they celebrated a harvest festival on the grassland. And later, you're going to see not just beautiful sceneries there, but also see how the local people sing and dance. And I don't know how clearly that you can see. So you can see this uh, very special and unique style of the Tibetan community. And this is also one beautiful scenery along the Yellow River. So this county is named Machu County. So Machu in Tibetan, it means Yellow River. So Yellow River is flowing across a total length of uh, 5,400 kilometers. And this is the only town that the Yellow River passes that is named after the Yellow River itself. So that is why it's a place worth going. So today we're going to bring all of you there to have some chat with the locals. And now let's come back to this magnificent map. So from this map, you can see that uh, the Yellow River flows from the very high land to the lower ground. So it travels across lands with uh, different attitudes. So when I describe the Yellow River, I can use one term. So it has nine different curves. Uh, 18 crisscrosses. So then it's here it uh, travels into the Inner Mongolia and then into uh, Shanxi province. So this is resembling the Chinese character of Ji. So I can tell you that this Chinese character is, has, al has almost become one synonym of the Yellow River. and. Uh, to uh, the world in Tibetan, it, mean, it means river. So we're not just using this term to describe the shape of the Yellow River. The term has vividly told us that the Chinese nation in itself is a family of different ethnic groups. So in today's program, we're going to bring you to the magnificence of the Yellow River and to bring you to the sound of the waves on a Yellow River and to the household that Yellow River flows across. So we are a interactive program, and uh, you are welcome to leave your comments. We are broadcast live on a couple of platforms. And if you are lucky, you will be able to receive a culturally creative product from this program. And now we're going to Getting to the point, and uh, let's come into the first photo. If you still remember that there are two guys standing at the hilltop, and I don't know what they are talking about. This is a photo from a movie by a very famous film director. Uh, let's introduce this director. He's very dedicated to films that talk about the Yellow River. He studied in Beijing. So he has spent his whole life and career exploring the beauty of the Yellow River. And in 2019, his latest work is called uh, uh, Killing a Ship with a Car Crash. So he has been exploring his own career path, yet combining the spirit with the Yellow River. And now let's uh, bring online the director. Good morning. Good morning. So where are you right now? So I'm in Shenzhou of Guangzhou um, on a forum. So is it related to movies? So, so this time is about literature. So apart from being a director, you are also a author. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm known as a film director, but I, I was a 
author before I became a film director. So I have spent a lot of years writing literature. So we know that uh, one Ma Cai Dan, you, uh, you live along the Yellow River, and in your film works, have you ever covered the Yellow River? Yes, but I did not write directly about the Yellow River because the Yellow River, the Yellow River flows across my village, and it's where I was born, and it's where I was raised up, and I had a lot of connections with the Yellow River. One of my deepest impressions about the Yellow River is that in winter, when the river freezes, we can walk on the ice to a very wild forest, which is right across the village. So we have to cross the river on the ice and get to the other side of the river bank to collect wood. So that is the most impressed thing that when you walk on the ice of the Yellow River, you can see that the river, uh, the water was just crystal clear, and you can see the different fishes swimming beneath your feet. So this is my most indelible memory about the Yellow River. And I thought at the time the Yellow River just had the most crystal clear water. So talking about the Yellow River, you thought it was crystal clear when you were a child, and it freezes, and you can step across the river on the ice. So can you tell us where it was? So my hometown was in Guizhou, and now they built a reservoir. And it's, it was called uh, the last year reservoir. It's a fairly big reservoir or a hydropower station. So. I have uh, grown up with the reservoir, and uh, when I was studying at the primary school, I couldn't remember where. I couldn't remember uh, when exactly, but uh, there was a survey dispatched by the ministry. I, I forgot which ministry it was, and. Uh, So they came and they built a very, very big uh, complex, and uh, they showed us some movies. Uh, it's my first encounter with the film, and I saw the film more than times. So it was quite a different experience at the time. A lot of the time, a lot of the movies that you saw at the time was domestic films, and then. At this cinema center, I saw modern times, and I still remember vividly about the film. And I think it's opened a new chapter of my personal life. And I can still remember a lot of the scenes of that movie up until present. So that's why we say that a lot of the memories from childhood are very vivid. So when the workers for the hydropower came. Did you speak this kind of uh, Mandarin today? No, not at all. When we were children, we didn't speak any Mandarin, and uh, our mother tongue was uh, Tibetan, and uh, I also speak a local dialect in Qinghai, and uh, I learned to I learned to speak Mandarin, Mandarin when I uh, became a college graduate, and I learned Mandarin from the TV operas the TV series and programs. So at the time, there were not so many TV sets. And uh, if you want to watch TV programs, you have to travel a long distance, maybe spend half an hour before you can get into a household that has a TV set. Then you can maybe only watch one episode of the program. So if you want to follow a TV program with 40 episodes, you have to spend a lot of time making the commute every day. So if I don't get it wrong, 
at the very beginning, you were majoring in Tibetan literature, and then you became a film director. So you received a lot of support from the government. And uh, so how was this journey like? So is this truly what you like? So I was raised from a very backward place, and uh, I had some unique experience. I like film. I think you know, with film, I can best tell my story. So that is why in college, I gradually picked up literature creation. I've always had a deep passion about movies. I've seen a lot of movies, particularly uh, the movies about a Charles Chaplin. And uh, at, at my time, it was very rare for a child to be exposed to Charles Chaplin's film. And uh, it was pretty striking. And I learned a lot of, I received a lot of inspirations from those movies. So the interest sustained there, and it went along with me until I became a college graduate. And I always dreamed of having an opportunity to study filmmaking. And then I got this opportunity. So that's how I gradually stepped on a career path of uh, filmmaking. I think this process is inseparable from my movie watching experience as a child. Without such a environment, without the exposure to a lot of the movies produced overseas, it was unimaginable that I stepped on this path of filmmaking. So when I was reading your resume, it says that you were one of the first batch of uh, film directors from your class. And uh, you know, it's pretty rare that you are engaged in filmmaking with this Mandarin. And it's very difficult for you to depict what is unique to your ethnic group using the Mandarin language. So do you think this is out of your sense of responsibility? Well, I think the reasons are very diverse. And what you just said is part of the reason. So a lot of my classmates, they've seen a lot of Tibetan movies, and there is a lot of dissatisfactions. So there are, for example, a lot of the folk customs in Tibet. There are some details, for example, people eating and uh, wearing clothing. And there were actually a lot of mistakes. So I want to produce movies that tell the culture of my ethnic race. So I had this mission from the very beginning, from the very beginning. And then I think it's out of interest. It's out of my passion for films. So I watched a lot of movies when I was a child. I developed a strong interest. So. We're talking about Yellow River. So the Yellow River is not just this river on China's geological map. The river is also connecting people of different ethnic groups. And this is also the significance of the Yellow River. And a lot of the times, viewers see that you as the film direc director, you want to use these very long shots, very long views. And why is that? Is that related to your experience growing up? Yes, it's definitely very related. Uh, it's related to where you grow up, how you grew up. I want to reflect my own experience through the screen. So this is telling the exact picture and pace of the lives of the locals. So this is telling the real scenery from the place where I grew up. And it's a very instantaneous and it's a very spontaneous reflection. 
on a screen. All right, now if you don't mind, we're gonna play a very short clip of your movie so more viewers can get to know what you were talking about. So what we are seeing right now is a a film called The Five Colored Arrow. So what does this movie tell us? So it tells a tradition of a locality. So each village has a competition of uh, bowman skills. And so this movie tells us the story that took place between two villages. The two villages live on both sides of the Yellow River. Uh, to participate in the competition, they have to take a boat to the other side of the village. So this memory comes from my real childhood memory. And uh, the movie was uh, filmed at Jianzha County at uh, south of Gansu province. Uh, when I was a child, my grandfather often took me there, and I participated in some of those competitions. And I remember taking the boats made of the fur of uh, sheep, and uh, I remember watching those contests. I had a lot of memories from those stories, and that's how I mingled them into this movie. And I brought this movie to the local villages because it tells the tradition there. All right, now let's uh, skip to the very last topic of our conversation. And I know that you have spent a lot of time living and working in Beijing. And uh, in 2018, you made some adjustments. So how long do you spend each year in Beijing? And how often do you live in Xining? So how do you balance this? In 2018, after 2018, because of the haze and smog in Beijing, I thought it was wise to move back to my hometown. So I spent more time in my hometown, and gradually I settled down in my hometown. So right now, it's between two cities in Beijing. Roughly, I spend two to three months every year. So in Beijing, most of the time I spent truly, uh, it was in my hometown in Xining. So when we say hometown, so no matter how far away you travel, no, ma no matter how big your world has become, there is always a place for hometown. So this is the nostalgic uh, sentiment that people have about their hometown. Exactly, yes. So now, So in the film works that you're going to engage in in the future, what will they be about? I'm preparing for a couple of works. There is a lot of uncertainties because of the pandemic. I'm not sure which one to start with. All right, thank you very much, Wan Ma Cai Dan. Thank you uh, very much for your time, and I hope to expect more of your movies from which I can expect more unique styles and characteristics about the Yellow River, about your hometown. And it's just striking that you are combining your artistic work with your personal story. Thank you very much. Wish you well. Thank you. So we just had a conversation with film director Wan Ma Cai Dan. We talked about the initial impression of the Yellow River to him. And uh, yesterday, when we were having the conversation, he told me that the most vivid memory is that he has to travel to the other side of the riverbank on the freezing ice. And he remembered that it was crystal clear 
to see the water beneath his feet, and it was in Guide, which is at the south of Gansu province. So, so this part of the river does not flow into the Yellow Earth Plateau, and so that is why it was crystal clear, and that is why in winter when the river freezes, in it, you could even see the fish swimming beneath your feet. So we want to protect the Yellow River so that the Yellow River can sustain in our old time memories. All right, now let's enter into the second session. At the very beginning, we showed you a couple of photos, and one of the photos was just so beautiful. And The photographer, his works were oftentimes included in National Geography, and uh, so this work is also from him. And uh, now we're going to get connected with Huang Shenghui, who is a very famous photographer, and uh, he is also a teacher at a special education school. Through his eyes, how will be how will the Yellow River look like? Hello, Huang Shenghui. Hi, dear viewers. Where are you right now? I'm at uh, the Pingyao International Photography Festival. So I heard that uh, you're going to have a personal exhibition there. Yes. So today we are just celebrating the opening ceremony. So we are now broadcasting live. On CGTN and also on China Central Television. Tell us about the exhibition. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I brought 15 of my photography works here. Can you hear me? Yes. So I brought 15 of my photography works on Yellow River, and those are white photos, and I'm telling the viewers how the Yellow River looks like at different curves, and uh, the exhibition lasts for like one week. So we just signed up yesterday. Uh, later at 10 o'clock, there will be a opening ceremony at the Pingya International Photography Exhibition Festival. So we can see a couple of photos behind you. Are those yours? No, those are others. Those are from others. So because uh, my works, uh, from where they are, they don't have very good uh, light. Can you uh, slightly adjust your microphone because there is an echo when you speak? Tell us why you included the Yellow River in your photography. So there were a lot of the people, particularly people who live in the upstream of the Yellow River, You know, they can take a lot of nice photos of the Yellow River, but why are you looking at the Yellow River from your angle, from those white photos? Well, I think the curves of the Yellow River can best demonstrate the spirit of the Chinese nation. So I want to be different from other photographers. I'm taking a lot of the photos using a drone. So I fly my drone to certain attitude. Sometimes I take dozens of shots, and then I connect those photos together so that I can form one very wide photo. So that is how you can see a lot more in one shot, in one photo. And it is through this technique that I can demonstrate the different curves of the Yellow River. Well, the drone is a new technology, and it's only uh, came about over the past few years. And uh, so in your imagination, you think the Yellow River should be magnificent, should be very long and very um, comprehensive. And uh, so you want to 
show the angle of an eagle of a bird from you know that is flying above exactly when I first started to take photos of the Yellow River I was using a traditional camera and I wanted to climb high to a hilltop to the very top point of uh, Pakoda because my hometown was in Gansu province where there were a lot of mountains so oftentimes I would climb up the mountain and have a bird view of the Yellow River and I thought the curves of the Yellow River is just very beautiful and it's you know I'm so attracted to this angle and with the development of the drone technology I started to pick up the drones because the drones they can tell the story more comprehensively so that's how I bring my drones to all across the country and to find those most picturesque curves I have a lot of friends who take photos with drones but they tell me that you know it's a pretty hard experience and you have to maybe destroy or break a lot of uh, drones uh, have you lost or destroyed or broken some of your drones well I think it's a must go through experience it's unimaginable to have just one drone to come up with this many photos and you have to go through the experience of breaking a lot of drones and I've had a lot of financial losses to be honest with you as a lot of the times my drones they may fall off not on the ground but in a yellow river and you cannot recover them you cannot find them so even though you had the insurance you wouldn't you know get the broken uh, broken piece yes without the broken piece you cannot claim the insurance you know if it falls into the yellow river there's no way that you can get get it maintained or repaired and so there was a lot of uh, nerves when I take the photo with the drones and uh, I think I have uh, broken more than 10 drones so using drones there is a limit of attitude but you know seeing your photo I think you know those are taken from a very high attitude and sometimes it's above the cloud and uh, so this is the angle of the God and uh, it must be very difficult to have to maybe first and foremost climb up uh, onto a hilltop and then uh, fly the drone from there yes with even with the drones you know at the very beginning I thought I don't need to climb up mountains but then I gradually learned about the height limit and then I have to climb up on a hilltop again and I have to maybe climb for 100 or 200 meters so you can have a perfect control of the height limit if you're just taking a photo with one angle you can only cover one curve or two curves of the Yellow River so what I do is I have my drones hover in the sky so I can you know focus on the Yellow River from different angles and then I do some uh, post editing so I connect all those different shots together and it's showing many different curves and that is why in my photo you see a lot of the curves and right now not so many photographers are doing this so there is a lot of uh, requirements on lighting and uh, a lot of your photos they're taken maybe in a morning or at the sunset so to be a good photographer photographer you have to get up early oh yes this is what we have to do I have very particular uh, requirements on lighting because you know it's only a certain time of the day can you truly discover the beauty of the Yellow River I think the Yellow River can best demonstrate the spirit of the Chinese nation a lot of the times you are living 
even living on a mountain for a couple of days just to wait for the perfect lighting. And in this process, you would uh, sometimes encounter some risks. So when I was taking a shot of the 13 curves, I uh, slipped twice and I hurt myself. I was uh, having bruises all over me, but even this couldn't stop my love for the Yellow River. So the last question. When we were introducing you at the beginning of this program, we told the viewers that wherever the Yellow River flows, you're going to follow the Yellow River to where it flows to. And do you find this great joy from this process? And so the Yellow River is flowing across a very long distance. How much have you covered? Have you covered half? And what will be your future focus if you take photos of the Yellow River? Well, I think I have just started. I haven't been to the Shandong section. For the other sections, I have photos about them. But as I told you, I want to just focus on the different curves and I if I if I find that one curve is particularly uh, attractive and then I'm gonna just drive there uh, we only take photos during holidays I think there is a lot sections that I haven't covered but right now because of time constraints you know I'm coordinating my work and my leisure and uh, I can only take photos during holidays and it's very difficult to balance. All right, thank you very much, Wang Shenghui. Let me give you another opportunity for your personal commercials. So uh, how long will this exhibition last? So it will last for one week. So for this week, if you travel to Pingya, you can actually come to this exhibition and you can see some very magnificent galleries and you will see a lot of photos taken from the aerial um, perspective. You will be able to appreciate the true beauty of the Yellow River. And also Wang Shenghui, so we had a very um, brief glimpse into your works and despite that I was very much inspired and by the sunset, by the sunrise of the Yellow River and uh, but pay particular attention to safety. Thank you very much. So we just had some conversation with uh, Wang Shenghui. So Wang Shenghui is pretty stubborn, I can say. Uh, he is teaching at a special education school and uh, as he has introduced, this is only his hobby and uh, he has to balance time from leisure and work and uh, he can only take photos when he has time but he's not wasting his time at all and he's dedicating whatever he can to those photos and now let's move on to our next guest Zheng Taijia. Zheng Taijia is a local in Qinghai province and uh, when he grew up he witnessed some of the changes along the River bank, and uh, he used to take a lot of risk even going to schools. But in 2016, there was a new bridge built, which brought about a lot of convenience to people living nearby. And now let's uh, get connected with uh, Zheng Taixiang. Hi. Hi. Hi, good morning. So let's introduce ourselves. My name is Zheng Taijia. My name is uh, uh, Zheng Taixia. So we are now at uh, Gamma River Curve. And uh, this is one section of the Yellow River. Let me bring you on a tour here and uh, we can also share some of our impressions and memories about the Yellow River. So now let's uh, walk and talk. So we're not at Gamma Yangqiu. So where the name, where does the name come about? There is a beautiful story 
behind the name. So do you know what the name means in Tibetan? So Gama used to be called Gamu Yechu. Gamu in Tibetan, it's a goddess in white. So what does Yangchi mean? So there was the beautiful legend that the goddess in white is living in a mount in that village and she saw this whirring uh, water on the Yellow River and uh, she believed this is the place that can gather wells and this is how the name came about and I was told this from the senior citizens in the village so let's uh, keep walking because the theme of today's conversation is Yellow River and now let's switch the camera and uh, do anyone know what this is? So this is the uh, faces of uh, cattle. So you may wonder why people do this. Why they pile up the faces of cattle? So a lot of you may ask, you know, what is the faces for? And uh, in this part of the country, we are burning the faces as a few. So this is part of the life experience here. The faces of the cattle can be burned for warming, it can be burned for cooking, and uh, in summer and uh, in autumn, there is a lot of precipitation, so it's soaking in rainwater and it doesn't vaporize. So that's how it took the shape. So I used to pay visit to the Tibetan area and I saw this kind of uh, faces piled up at the homes of the Tibetans. And it reminds me of the old time when we were primary school students and we were studying in a room without warming system and uh, then there were tractors which would bring piles and piles of uh, cattle faces. So we as the primary school students we were just dispatched to the tractors to bring back those fences so that we can get a little warmer in winter. So I remember I was always the first one to rush to the tractor. I was the first to set the uh, faces on fire and uh, so it's one very particular experience and at the time you don't feel this is quite enjoyable but it's only after time that you realize how valuable your experience was. So this is the path that we have to go through when we go to school. In the past it used to be very wide can take a look at the floor. So at the time it was only five meters wide. At the point of turns, it's pretty risky for the trucks to just pass the road. So from here to Guinan County, starting from 8 o'clock in the morning. And it may travel four hours. It takes four hours for a truck to travel from Guinan County to here. So when we go to school, we have to overcome stormy rains, very risky trucks, very muddy road.
From here, you can see the corrosion by the rainwater on the slopes on both sides of the road. So when we had stormy rains, you can see this very clear corrosion to the slope. You can see there are a lot of uh, debris on a mountain slope, and uh, whenever it rains, those debris, they may roll over and roll off to the road, and uh, it's pretty risk. It's pretty risky, and a lot of times the, the the mountain slope may simply collapse onto the road, and it's very dangerous. Keep walking. So it's a pretty long, pretty long journey, simply to go to school. Sorry for the bad signal. So let me quickly repeat what I was saying. And so this is a river for you to uh, distribute the flood. So at the extreme weathers and the rain water may just you know follow this river. And without this river. There is a high risk that the rainwater may uh, cross the mountain slopes, and uh, there can there can be landslides. So, with the river, the danger was significantly reduced. So, this can counter the risks of. Landslides, and on the other hand, it can also increase the coverage of the grain. You can see better plantation at the mountain slopes. You can see that uh, this is consolidated using cement, so this can guard against the risk of corrosion and landslides. And so this is the Yellow River on this side. So at extreme weather, the Rainwater will be flowing into the Yellow River. So what you now see a typical on the Plato region. 
Pakistan gets in front. There's a lot of ribbons on the bridge. So there is a saying in this locality that those colorful ribbons are only hung on places that are very high and so, so when it winds you can see those uh, ribbons flying in the air. So in Tibetan area people attach those colorful ribbons on bridges, on big construction sites, on high mountains. They express their sincere aspiration for prosperity and safety in this way. Blue represents the blue sky, white represents the white clouds, so different colors telling you different things here. And also it's written inscriptions. So it's pretty difficult simply to hang those ribbons here. It looks just magnificent. 